Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'm gonna be your host and question asker and retriever in today's class today. Today I'm here with Tom Donnelly. He's one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center, and we are both just unbelievably excited to dive into civil liberties. So let's do that, let's dive in deep. So Tom, I'm gonna tee you up with the first big question of the day. What are civil liberties and how have they been defined over time? Well, thanks so much, Curry, and thanks everyone for being here. So what are civil liberties? I mean, I think the simplest way to think about them are really these are our, our most cherished individual rights. And so the, the actual term people have used has changed over time. If you were to ask the founding generation, they would probably speak really in terms of natural rights. You know, we see people beginning to speak of civil liberty, especially once we get to the Civil War and Reconstruction in the late 1800s and more so in the 20th century. But fundamentally, civil liberties are our most cherished freedom. So things like the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, the rights of the accused, the right to a jury trial. And so we're going to tick through a lot of these, but I, I, I sort of just begin there. It, 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 very simple definition like that, Curry. Yeah, and I, I think that we have so many questions for today and we have to fly through time, but I think it's really important as we think about this grouping of civil liberties, or what are some of the big ideas of those basic rights that we have to ensure a fair process in ensuring individual rights in our government. So when we think of big ideas you hear underneath the umbrella of civil liberties, we're gonna talk about the courts and their role in protecting these civil liberties or not really protecting the civil liberties. We're gonna definitely talk about freedom of speech and religion as like fundamental rights, but due process is a big one. We hear a lot about due process, about privacy, about equal protection of the laws, and then how we ensure that these rights are incorporated to every individual in our country. And then my favorite is habeas corpus, not just because it sounds cool, but because you think about it, what does it mean? It means show me the body, show me the evidence. You have to give me a fair process, and you have to tell me what is against me during this. So Tom, as we jump through this, you know, this was something that our founding generation was influenced by in ensuring that we put it into the constitution and we put it into the Bill of Rights. But where did this, these ideas really come from? Um, and how do we make sure that this is a part of our values, civil liberties are part of our values as Americans? Well, I love that. I love that point, Curry, because if, if you were to ask James Madison, we'll go, I think we'll start with the declaration, but you made me think of Madison. So Madison wrestled with whether or not we needed a Bill of Rights, whether or not we really needed these rights written into our constitution. And he was initially skeptical because he thought that so many times what history has proven is that governments don't respect the rights written on paper. But when he came around, one of the reasons he came around to a Bill of Rights was because he thought the Bill of Rights would serve a great educational purpose for the American people in a young republic. They would have in a document written that they could understand the most fundamental rights that they are meant to value and meant to be able to tell their government, do not violate these. If you violate these, you are undermining your very purpose. And so Madison, Madison thought by having those written into the constitution that everyone could learn what it was to be a free person in America. So that's just a bit, I just, I just, I wanted to pause on that educational point. Um, but you know, if we're thinking about the founding generation, you know, where, where is the foundation for this? Let's start with the Declaration of Independence. Let's begin with that really, really famous language in the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is just a basic idea that we get certain natural rights. They derive from God or from nature, not from government. And these are things that we can claim as against the government. We can say, we have these rights, government do not violate them. And backing up this is the greatest right of all, which is if the, if the government is not promoting our life, liberty, happiness, if it's not promoting our security, if it's not securing these rights, if it's abusing us, we have the fundamental right to abolish or alter that form of government, to put one in place that's gonna secure our happiness and freedom. And so with that, Curry, you know, we get, you know, what is the, the great initial flashpoint in American history? It's over these civil liberties. What's the first way we lay claim to our civil liberties? Through revolution. Because what we say is, you British Empire, you are not honoring our natural rights, our rights as members of the British Empire. You are not treating us as free and equal people. And so we are going to get rid of you, 
and have our own government. We're going to have freedom and independence. You did things like the quartering acts where you said, you know, soldiers could be forced into your homes. You had things like the general warrants where you would give royal officials sort of a blank slate to go into any house, any business and search around our most private materials for any purpose. This was of course to enforce laws that many America, that many of the colonists thought were tyrannical coming from Britain, but nevertheless, it just, it violated core privacy interests. They would, you know, the British empire would take Americans who were accused of violating these laws and have them not tried by juries, but by royal judges, sometimes not in their own communities, but shipped elsewhere. And so all of these things were seen as so violative of our most fundamental civil liberties. I think that's, it's almost like how it was going and how it's now. Like this idea that like life, liberty, pursuit of happiness is, is our right and that, that no government shall. And I, like when you think about liberty, that's, you can't come into my home and take my stuff without a really good reason and a really good purpose. You can't stop me from having life by putting me in jail without a jury of my peers. And you can't, you know, even in the basic sense, I'm allowed to get a job, I'm allowed to travel, pursuit of happiness. I think that an understanding of who we are and how we wanna live is a value we put into the declaration and then ensure it through the constitution that there at least has to be a fair process if one of those things is gonna be held back. But I love the idea that you said is like, and if the government doesn't, go ahead, you can, you can dissolve it. You can have a revolution. You can blow it up. So that's like a deal then, a contract we make with the government. We get to have this. You can't step on it. And if you step on it, we're able to dissolve you, you know, break glass in case of emergency. So how do we really write this? So, you know, the idea and the values are in the declaration, but we write it into the law with the Constitution. Where do we see it kind of pop up in the Constitution? just in the Bill of Rights or are there some other areas? I mean, the Bill of Rights are the most famous. You know, before the Bill of Rights, we have, you know, the first thing we have to do before a national constitution is write state constitutions. And so we have very famous state declarations of rights like the Virginia Declaration of Rights authored by George Mason, which are early bills of rights that Madison's able to look to when putting together the National Bill of Rights. So we have those, but even in the US constitution itself before we have a Bill of Rights. So the original constitution, we have some guarantees for jury trials in, in, in criminal cases. Um, we do have protections for the writ of habeas corpus, which you mentioned, Curry. We put limits on when the national government could suspend that writ. And so there are some individual rights in there. But as we know, you know, when, when you know, the, 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 the delegates in Philadelphia write the Constitution in 1787, they sign their names to it. So three of them don't. You know, we have the three dissenters, George Mason, Elbridge Gerry, uh, Edmund Randolph. In part, what, they're, what they are angry about is that the delegates didn't put a Bill of Rights into the Constitution. This criticism of the Constitution not having a Bill of Rights, it, it comes to dominate a lot of the debates over whether or not the American people vote yes or no on the Constitution, whether or not they choose to ratify it. And so supporters of the Constitution, most notably James Madison, learns from this experience, learns from the ratification debates, learns with letters that he's exchanging with his great friend, Thomas Jefferson, who's in France at the time, has some problems with the US Constitution, wasn't there when it was framed, has some problems with it, with it in terms of its structure, but also fundamentally has problems with it because it doesn't have a Bill of Rights. And so Madison takes it upon himself, he gets elected to the US House of Representatives, so he serves in the first Congress. And what he does there is he says, okay, I was initially skeptical, I didn't necessarily think we need a Bill of Rights. I still don't know if it's actually gonna work or do anything, quite frankly, but it can't hurt. And it would give great quiet to the American people. Many people oppose this constitution, which I think is a good constitution because it doesn't have a bill of rights. So maybe it'll do some good. And so in the first Congress, he decides to try to set out what are our most fundamental rights? What do we want to protect? What do we want written into the constitution? And the lesson he learned from the ratification debates was that the anti-federalists, those who opposed the constitution said, you're creating a new powerful national government at a very, at the most basic level, let's, let's at least write clear limits on national power in there. And so Madison's trying to figure out what should those limits be. And so he draws on state constitutions. He draws on ideas from the anti-federalists from the ratification debates, dissenters from the various state conventions during the ratification debates. And eventually we come up with this bill of rights that we see today, these first 10 amendments. And within them, you know, it, 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 the question arose, like, what are some examples of civil liberties? Well, we see them everywhere in there. And so, you know, again, Madison's challenge here as he's putting together the Bill of Rights is which rights to include, which rights do we include? 
And so a lot of what he's drawing on are some of the most prominent rights we see in state bills of rights. And so let's think, so what are some of the key protections? Well, the First Amendment has free speech, free press, religious liberty. So we see that there, those are obvious, those are fundamental civil liberties. But then Curry has some great examples up there on the screen too. We see the Second Amendment, which over time ha has been interpreted to provide some sort of a right to self-defense. So the Supreme Court in landmark recent decisions, Heller and McDonald's say that at its core, the Second Amendment must mean that you have a right to defend your home. You know, where we might apply it elsewhere, those are still open questions of constitutional law, but at the core, at the core of the Second Amendment is that individual right to be able to protect yourself, to protect your home. You know, if we look across then the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments, one of the great themes we see across all three is rights for people who are accused of crimes. And again, in America, one of our most fundamental principles is that people are innocent, they're presumed innocent. They're innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. We are not walking, you know, criminals. We're not presumed criminals in the United States. And so each of these protections are there to make sure that the government doesn't abuse its power and ultimately abuse our civil liberty. So the Fourth Amendment speaks to a lot of the things that we value most. The way we, we would talk about it today is our privacy interests. Where do we, where do we, what, where do we think, where do we cherish our privacy most? It says it in the Fourth Amendment. Ourselves, so our bodies, our homes, various, the things that we have. And so with this, with the Fourth Amendment, what it says is if the government's going to try to search these things, if the government wants to search my home, if it wants to search my desk, if it wants to search me, the government needs a really good reason. It can't just do it for no reason. It has to have a particular reason to suspect that I have committed a crime. And so that's fundamentally what the Fourth Amendment is about. If we look into the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, we see more rights of the accused in there. So the Fifth Amendment is where we, we'll talk about Miranda versus Arizona, that landmark case a little later, but this is where we get the, 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 the key part of what everyone knows from police procedurals, police television shows, the right to remain silent. So the right against self-incrimination over right to remain silent, et cetera, et cetera, that's there in the Fifth Amendment. And then with the Sixth Amendment, we see other protections associated with, especially jury trials in criminal cases. So if you're gonna be tried for a crime, you're gonna have an impartial jury. You're going to, it's gonna be a speedy trial. It's gonna take place roughly where the crime took place. We're gonna take the jury from roughly that area too. And here with the, with the Sixth Amendment, what we're doing is we're correcting a lot of the things we thought the British Empire got wrong. Because for the founding generation, the jury was the great bulwark of our liberties. It was a way to check abusive prosecutors, abusive judges. If they, in the end, want to charge us and then convict us of a crime, they have to convince a jury of our peers. And that assures a certain amount of justice. And so finally, Curry, the last two concepts you see there in the Fifth Amendment, one is the takings clause. So this is protecting, you know, for the founding generation, especially Madison. You know, there was a real focus on the value of property rights. And this says that the government can't take your property unless it's gonna use it for some sort of public use and unless it gives you money for that property. And so this is a certain protection for our property rights written there. It's, we call it the takings clause, but that's the basic idea there. Um, and then the other one is, and I wanna end on it because it's the really, really big one in a lot of ways. This is in the Fifth Amendment, it's the due process clause. And it's saying that, you know, in the end, the government can't deprive us of life, liberty or property without due process of law. So if the government's gonna take our life, it's gonna take our liberty, so it's gonna throw us in prison, or if it's gonna take some of our property, what this fundamentally broadly protects is that they have to have some sort of fair process, some sort of fair procedure in place. It can't just be the whim, it can't just be because the king feels like it. There has to be an actual legal process. In a lot of ways, Curry, you know, we often struggle with how do we define the rule of law and what it means? I think this is one of the ways in which we're really fundamentally defining it in our constitution. Um, and so, you know, there's a way in which this concept is written in very specific ways in some of the other amendments, but we say it very, very broadly right here. And in many ways, um, it's, it's the most fundamental right of all. Yeah, and I think it's really in, important. It's when we look at life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, it is ensuring that if it is taken care of, it must follow a clear, transparent, and open process that it's not just somebody in a corner making decisions and saying this is what we believe that the laws the rule of law is clear but it's also followed for everybody the same way in an equitable way and we're going to get into like what does it really mean to be fair and equitable when we talk about Gideon and pieces like that um, and I know we're going to dive into this but two other questions around this how would you define the word liberty Emily asked that I thought it was a great question to ask 
Yeah, that is a great question. I mean, the way I think about it is in the relationship of me to my government. And so these are certain things, these are certain rights that attach to us where we could tell the government, no, 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 you can't touch these things. Or if you do, you need a really good reason. I think that, you know, the way we would think about it today often would be, you know, it's the freedom to do what you want along many of these dimensions, as long as you're not hurting somebody else. I think there is like, there, there's that sense, the government can step in because that's one of the reasons we create the social contract to protect others if we're abusing our liberties. So they would, the founding founders would have called this licentiousness is the fancy word, but it's really the idea of us doing too much and going crazy because of our liberties. Government can step in if we're gonna harm others, but otherwise there's a certain freedom of action and a claim we can lay against the government. So like basically liberty is your ability to you to just do you. Like you do you. Yeah, back off. The yeah, <laughs> yeah, but the government can't step on that unless it's infringing on other people's liberties. Okay, got it. That makes sense. I love that modern definition of it. Joe wanted a little clarification on once, so they go through the ratification process and people are freaking out and they're not gonna ratify the constitution because there is no bill of rights, a couple other reasons, but that is a nutshell. And Joe's question, so, so did the majority of people not agree with the constitution because it didn't include a bill of rights? But then after it was added, did they put their mind, did, did it put the minds of the American people to rest? Oh, that's such a great question. I love that question so much. I know. Because in the end, so you, what you have to remember is, so the answer is yes, it did actually put a lot of minds to rest. But the Federalists, so the people who supported the Constitution, won the first set of elections in landslides. And so a lot of them wanted to, wanted to say, oh, we don't really want the Bill of Rights. Why would we put this in there? We won. And it was Madison who had the, who had the insight to realize no, no, no. If this project is going to work, those who oppose the Constitution are people of goodwill. They're virtuous citizens like us. They're expressing their dissent. They need to be part of this project, too. Let's argue. Let's bring them in so we can argue within the framework of the Constitution rather than having them attacking it from beyond the Constitution. Awesome. OK, now and then we're, we're going to cruise on time because we're going to keep this to 30 minutes. But real quick. So when we look at the Bill of Rights, we look at this beauty of the civil liberties spelled out in there. Um, the but number one question is always, at this point in time, Bill of Rights is added. It is saying that the federal government cannot step on your civil liberties without due process of law, without having evidence of the body, all those pieces. But what we see happening across the states is the state stepping on individuals' civil liberties. So what really kind of makes the big change there? And is it like, a okay, we make the change and everything is good to go? Or is it a you know, slow struggle and battle for civil liberties to be applied? I'm gonna lead into the second one, people, but I'll tee it up for you, Tom. Yes, as with most big things, it, it does take a while. Uh, but no, there is a major change in thinking between the founding and what we call the second founding, that period of the Civil War and Reconstruction. So for the founding generation, the fear is a large tyrannical national government that's distant from us, that we, you know, we're not gonna travel outside our communities. The, the government might as well be in England rather than in, in, the, in the nation's capital here in America, it's so far away. But what we learned between then and then the Civil War and Reconstruction is states can really abuse liberties too. And so if you're looking at it from the perspective of that generation that fought and won the Civil War, and then the generation that led Reconstruction after that, you know, for them, they're looking at this experience and they're saying states really can abuse power too. Once this, the Southern states seceded, what bigger abuse of power is there than that? But they would also look back and look back, what were many of these Southern states doing prior to the Civil War? So, you know, the great author of section one of the 14th Amendments, John Bingham, a representative from the state of Ohio. And if you were to ask Bingham, you know, what are we doing here with the 14th Amendment? What's one, at least one of the big ideas? And he would have said, you know, prior to the Civil War, the, a lot of these states, especially in the South, they weren't respecting free speech. So for instance, they had laws that banned anti-slavery speech, anti-slavery press, anti-slavery meetings. And so that's violative of one of our most fundamental liberties. They also had laws in place saying in, you can't teach enslaved people to read. African-Americans can't meet for religious services together. And so Bingham would look back and say, those are serious abuses to things that we care about most. In a new America after the Civil War, we fought the Civil War precisely to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. And then for him and his colleagues also, they looked at things that were starting to happen right after the Civil War. So we have a lot of ex-Confederates coming back to power in the South right after the Civil War. And what did they do? Well, they put in place the Black Codes. And so African-Americans 
We have emancipation. We have a formal end to slavery, but we have these, these governments led by ex-Confederates trying to pass laws to place African-Americans back into something that was like slave-like conditions, conditions where they couldn't follow the, the, the occupation they wanted, where they couldn't enter into contracts, where they couldn't easily purchase a home, where they couldn't, you know, frankly, in terms of fundamental liberties, keep and bear arms. You know, what's one of the first things that these governments attempt to do? They try to take guns away from old African-American Union soldiers, seeing that as dangerous. And if you're an African-American in, in the South at that time, you can't trust the government to keep you and your family safe. And so if African-Americans, that was such a core protection that they cared about then. And so we had this amazing period where, you know, we're trying to set new baselines for America. We have African-Americans meeting in convention, especially in the South, joining together and explaining to us what rights are being violated of theirs right now. What rights do they need to live free and equal in America? And so we have this amazing track record. And eventually the Reconstruction Generation writes many of these lessons into the 14th Amendment. And Curry has the, the key text there highlighted, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And here, this is where the big idea behind this, many of those key, those key protections we see in the Bill of Rights, those civil liberties, they first applied to the national government. Now they're going to apply to the states. Now I, as an American, I can lay claim to free speech rights if my state is violating. I can lay claim to religious liberty if my state is violating them. And it's, it's, it's a text, it's, it's a transformation. It's why we do refer to this as a true second founding. It, that's amazing. Um, there's also some career path planning going on for your judgeship in the chat that I'm also laughing at. Oh, Sorry. excellent, thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I think this is so fascinating. So there's the, this kind of push to really take the declaration and go from vision document into constitutional practice. Um, and then, you know, incorporation, like applying it to the states. It's not just, okay, done, check that box. And now the Bill of Rights is associated with every individual, not just associated with stopping the federal government. It takes time, it's slowly piecemeal put in. And we have some major pushbacks. And I think one of the stories of major pushbacks is Crookshank. And this is really where you see unbelievable violence towards African-American communities and kind of the court case around what are the protections, the equal protections and the privileges and immunities of citizenship. And I know we're gonna jump from this into the modern cases, but could you just, it, it's not a clear, once it's in the constitution, it, does, it still means we have hundreds of years of fighting and violence to kind of ensure that, it, that these protections begin to be really met. Yeah, no, that's right. The, the first wave of Supreme Court cases we see in the 1870s, 1880s under the 14th Amendment reads it quite narrowly. We do not see incorporation. We do not see John Bingham's 14th Amendment realized until many, many years later. And so we see a very restrictive reading of the 14th Amendment initially. But as we get into the 20th century, we see a change. And part of this is, even in this period I'm talking about, the 1880s, 1890s, late 1870s, we have a key dissenting justice, John Marshall Harlan, still writing dissents on the Supreme Court saying, we need to keep, keep, we need to, to keep faith with John Bingham's vision, with the Reconstruction vision, incorporation should be the right rule. He lost them. But as we get, I think the key, one key point is 1925, Gitlow, Gitlow versus New York, is really the first case where what you're talking about is when does the incorporation revolution start? When do we move piece by piece, case by case to incorporate more and more rights? People would usually point to Gitlow as the start. And that's where the Supreme Court says, first free speech under the First Amendment, yeah, that applies against the states. That's fundamental. And for the court, they're asking a, a practical question case by case. Basically, is this right, this right that's in the Bill of Rights truly fundamental? If so, we're going to incorporate it. And so what, what we call this over time is we call it it's selective incorporation. So it's really a case by case process. But ultimately, and it's a real fight. There are justices that disagree with this. We see dissents in so many of these cases, and it's a real battle. And it would take really important justices, like Justice Hugo Black, who really cared, who, who knew his John Bingham, knew his Reconstruction history, to really fight for incorporation. And ultimately, we incorporate almost every right in the Bill of Rights, including, as Curry has up here, two cases just in the last couple of years. Tim's in, 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 in 2018, incorporating the excessive fines clause of the Eighth Amendment, and Ramos versus Louisiana just last year, incorporating protections for a unanimous jury right. 
Um, and so those are just, the revolution continues. And there's still the Third Amendment hasn't been incorporated, the Seventh Amendment civil liberty, uh, civil jury right. So there are a few, um, but this is a, a, a revolution that happened over time. And Curry, the key point, so one is get low, so that we mm-hmm. begin to see it. But we see, and I love the little preview, Earl Warren there, it's really the, the Warren court revolution that brings the incorporation revolution into full blossom because it does two things, Curry. It's not just bringing in more rights and saying that they apply against the states because the court was already doing that in some context, but reading those rights, very they were weak rights. We would rarely strike down laws, rarely throw out convictions. And with, but with the Warren court, we see them both bring in more rights and read those rights in really, really, really strong ways. Um, and so should we, go, should we give some examples? Yeah, I guess, just so we uh, like understand the, the time frame is we have uh, 1868 is the 14th Amendment mm-hmm. ratified. And then it's, you know, you start to really begin to see this taking hold in 1925. So this is a long struggle. And it, so Colin's question in the chat is, did, did Congress make an attempt to utilize Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and kind of do some work around this? Or, and the courts push it back? Or was there just no big attempt? Well, there were initial attempts during the height of Reconstruction, like in 18, you know, 1870, 1871, yeah. but very, very little after that. Got it. And then, so we really see this, what you said is this big, broad change in not just applying the um, 14th Amendment and the Bill of Rights through incorporation, but also reading these much broader. So that's like a double whammy comes from the Warren Court and we're looking for a big change. And the thing that I think is fascinating about these cases is they pick these cases, the court, and just remember the court picks cases to make a statement in ways and to say like, we're gonna look at this case, this is going on for a while, we've been watching it over time and now we're ready to dive into this and make a ruling on this. So I think there's a lot of intentionality that goes into these case choices. And these next two cases are two of my favorites. All right, so let's start with Gideon versus Wainwright, 1963. This is the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. See Clarence Earl Gideon right there. And so what happened here? Well, the case arises, the facts, it's a burglary burglary at a pool hall in, in Florida. And so someone steals some beer, steals, steals some wine, steals some change out of the jukebox, um, so we're not really, we're not talking about the crime of the century here. It's not a huge crime, but Clarence Earl Gideon is accused of the crime. And so he himself, he's around 50 years old. You know, he's, a, he, he's, he's been convicted, I think, of four separate crimes in the past. He spent 17 years of his life in jail. So he's, you know, a gambler. I would say he's a petty criminal. If you were to ask him, I, I, I read, you know, if you were to ask him, people who knew him in prison, they would say, you know, he's not a violent guy. He's not particularly dangerous. He's pretty harmless. But he certainly has committed crimes over time. And so Gideon is accused of this crime. He's brought before a Florida court and he goes into court and he says, you know, I want an attorney. I want a lawyer. I'm poor. I can't afford one. Under the Sixth Amendment, I should have a right to an attorney. And the judge says in reply, well, in Florida, we only limit uh, free counsel for poor defendants in the case of, of big crimes like death penalty cases. This isn't that. So you have no right to an attorney. And under Supreme Court case law at the time, that's absolutely true. The Supreme Court said, you know, just two decades before that in a case called Betts, that the Sixth Amendment does not apply to the states. So the states have flexibility to determine when to provide counsel. I mean, the, the, the flip side is that most states would provide counsel in this situation. Florida was among a minority of states that really didn't give counsel in a lot of situations. And so what happens? Gideon represents himself and he's convicted. He sent us to five years in prison. And so he gets to jail. And what does he do? He becomes a jailhouse lawyer. And so he studies the Constitution. He studies the law. And he thinks, you know what? I was right in court. The Sixth Amendment really does guarantee me a right to counsel. So he takes out a sheet of paper, picks up his pencil. He didn't have a mechanical pencil like this. But he writes out a little note to the Supreme Court, arguing his case. He sends it to the court, his pencil written note to the court. The court receives it. And they, they interpret it as an appeal, as a habeas petition. So it's this, this, it's literally, it's this handwritten note that he wrote right there in the jail. And the justices take it up like they would any other petition in their Friday conference. They discuss it and they take the case. They actually take the case. And Gideon himself doesn't have to represent himself before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court appoints him the best lawyer, arguably, in Washington, D.C., Abe Fortas, who himself would go on to serve on the Supreme Court. And so they argue, Fortas argues Gideon's case. And the Supreme Court ultimately in a unanimous decision written by Hugo Black says, Gideon is right. 
Gideon is right. He has a right to counsel here. And so they throw out his conviction. This is like a made for Hollywood thing. There is an actual movie where he's played by Henry Fonda. There's a great book by uh, New York Times Supreme Court reporter Anthony Lewis called Gideon's Trumpet, which you could read about this. But I, I think the best summary I can give Curry is to, to borrow from our friend Akhil Lamar, which what's the big idea here? It's that, you know, we don't want to be convicting people in America because they're poor. We want to convict them because they're guilty. And the best way to ensure that we get that right is to make sure that everyone is represented by counsel. So whether they're rich or poor, whether they're poor or whether they're the state government, that we have counsel on both sides. Yeah, and I think, and Kevin was asking a question, isn't that because the case moved to the Supreme Court, which is a federal institution, that the clarity of at this time, it was you were you got a, a a lawyer appointed on a federal level, but not on a state level. And that's really the whole point of Gideon saying, it's not fair. If I'm being prosecuted, I should have it at all levels of this process, just yeah. to clarify. Yeah, I mean, and not everyone's going to get aid for this. Um, but no, yeah, exactly. but, it is, but, 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 it's a, but it's a great question, Curry, because remember, what ends up happening to Gideon? He's actually retried. And so it's the same witnesses. It's the same evidence. It's the same court, the same judge, the same sort of jury. The big difference is he gets counsel the next time and he's acquitted. He's found not guilty. And so then, so, so many things change. Because he takes it to the federal, he gets a, 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 a lawyer. And then the court says you are must have one at every level. And then he is acquitted. And then the crime is absolved because this wasn't fair. This wasn't a just and fair process and he didn't commit it. Now, I, it leads me to so many questions around what level of counsel is considered fair? And is that a modern question around this? So how about if I get like a dud, like not to be like mean, but they're like a dud lawyer. Is that a fair and equitable process when the the person that you get could not maybe be the same um, on different levels? But we can kind of ponder that question as we get into Miranda, because it's also knowing your rights before you get all the way through to the court system, too. You know, that's, that's right, Curry. Um, and so, you know, Miranda is three years later. In a lot of ways, it's the high point of what people call the, the Warren Court's criminal procedure revolution. So where the Warren Court is reading uh, different Bill of Rights protections for the accused in a really robust and strong way. And so what happens in Miranda? Well, in this situation, what we're dealing with is, a situa is, is the right to self-incrimination and sort of the practices that police can use to get or not use to get a confession from someone accused of a crime. And so if we're looking at from the court's perspective, you know, they're looking at two different things here. So they're getting all sorts of, there have been commissions, they're reading all sorts of reports that, you know, one big problem is that especially in the South, African-American defendants or, or people who are accused are not treated well in police custody. And so we see not just trickery, but violence. And so there is a real concern about in practice, we're seeing that far too often and that's violative of, of, of you know, the core protection that you're seeing there and our core dignity as human beings. So that's one thing the Warren Court cares about. The other is that the court itself in previous cases has a, has a rule in, the, in this situation where what they wanna make sure is that a confession is actually voluntary. And the rule that they have in place is a really, really loose, fuzzy standard. It's really, can be applied in a lot of different ways, doesn't have a lot of bite. And so if I'm reading between the lines what the Warren Court and Earl Warren himself who writes the majority opinion in Miranda is interested in doing, he wants a clearer rule. He wants a bright line rule that's going to be more protective of people of the rights of the accused. And so, you know, let's let's look at it. So who is Ernesto Miranda? Well, he's a he's a 23 year old uh, Latino man. Um, he, you know, poorly educated. He's a, accused of a serious crime. And so the police bring him into bring him into custody. Um, and what they do is they, they have they have a witness and they have the witness look at a lineup with with Miranda and others. And they ask the witness, you know, do you see the person who committed the crime in this room? And what she's able to tell the police is. I think it could be that guy, but I'm really not sure. You know, it, 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 it could be, but I'm not sure. And so she thinks it could be Miranda. She's not sure. But the police then do is they go to Miranda and say, she got you. You've been identified. We've got you. And Miranda then says, oh, OK, you got me. And then he confesses to the crime and he's ultimately convicted of it. Um, but his counsel looks at this and, 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 and says, you know, what we're seeing here is we're seeing two big rights violated. One is the right to self-incrimination. The other is right to counsel. And both of these things, these are rights that he did not know that he had and that that violates the Constitution. And so the court ultimately divides five to four. So Gideon versus Wainwright, that was a unanimous opinion. This divided the justices more closely. 
Uh, but ultimately, in an opinion by Earl Warren, I think this he puts it very well. Here's, here's a quote from Warren in Miranda. Um, it is not admissible to do a great right by doing a little thing wrong. It is not sufficient to do justice by obtaining a proper result by irregular or improper means. And so what, what Warren's saying here is we really do want to make sure that these core constitutional rights are understood and protected. We want a bright line rule. And we want to make sure because of this, the hope is that we're going to get rid of a lot of the trickery and a lot of the violence that we see in confessions. And we're going to give, importantly, moving forward, the police and the government very clear rules to follow so they also can make sure that they're following the proper procedures. And, and I think it's it's really, really unbelievable that these huge changes happen and we can look at the Gideon case and say, what a great and amazing story. And our students were asking what happened to Gideon after the court case. Um, and he pretty much lives his life out. Um, he does actually die of cancer. And then we can look at Miranda and say, okay, you know, it's not the best storyline. It's not the best like warm and fuzzy story. But at the end of the day, in our process, is to ensure that everybody is treated equally and fairly and given the tools that they need to have a fair process and you're assumed innocent and that the system must follow the right way. I think you said it before, Tom, you talked about uh, Earl Warren saying that we need to follow a fair and just process, not just have the right outcome. Yeah, and I mean, again, that's a practical matter. This is why on those police shows, you see the right to remain silent and all of that. That is deriving, if you read Earl Warren's opinion, it's basically right in there and he's providing a template for the police officers moving forward to ensure that they're protecting everyone's rights. Now the, the critics, the dissent and critics moving forward would say, this makes it easier for actual criminals to go free. And I think that Earl Warren would say in reply, well, the way our system's designed is to allow that sometimes because the worst evil that we're trying to avoid is an innocent person being punished and thrown in prison. Awesome, that's amazing. We're a little over students and we're sorry about that, but it was an awesome class, but a fascinating way to kind of look through time at these big ideas of what are our base freedoms and how do we set up a system of government that has a process to follow a fair and just system.